Hello there, welcome to this week's edition of the Healthy Talk. This week we are discussing COVID-19 vaccines. To help us discuss the COVID-19 vaccines, we have former Health Minister Dr. Henry Mazzorera. Let's hear from him as he starts by telling us the benefits of the vaccines. The concept of a vaccine is to put a little bit of the disease uh, in a person so that uh, the body recognizes that antigen and starts making antibodies to it. Now the body has got cells that are called memory cells. These may be B memory cells or T memory cells. Um, these memory cells now remember that antigen uh, for a long time. So when the real thing comes, the real virus, the real bug comes, there is already a template for making the antibodies, the soldiers that fight that virus. So it will take only a, a, a day or two for the body to make the antibodies and start fighting the virus before it multiplies and uh, colonizes the whole body and causes disease. This is how we have conquered uh, diseases like smallpox. Smallpox is now a thing of the past. We used vaccines to eliminate it. We are nearly about to eliminate um, polio from Zimbabwe. Uh, we are using the polio vaccine. And you will see that there are you know, a dozen vaccines that we are giving now in Zimbabwe for various diseases. It's to train the body to be able to make antibodies to fight the disease before the disease actually comes. Uh, vaccines are extremely important. Vaccines are extremely useful. Dr. Mazzorera, who should or should not take vaccines? Can those with allergies accept vaccines? At the moment, we are vaccinating everybody 18 years and above. So these are various categories of people with different uh, uh, profiles. Uh, the 18 years to about 59 years is a different age group from 60 and above you know, who are a bit more elderly. Uh, we are not yet vaccinating people under 18 in Zimbabwe, but there are other countries which have started vaccinating people uh, from 11 to 17 years, and the, the age groups keeps going down. They are doing trials to see if these vaccines are safe in those age groups. So we will get to know as time goes on, but for now, we are struggling to meet the requirement for the 18 years and above age group. People with diabetes mellitus, people with hypertension, people with HIV, all those people should uh, get vaccinated. They are more at risk uh, of COVID-19 uh, serious uh, disease. So they should get vaccinated and really probably get priority. Uh, the only thing we encourage is make sure that your disease is under control. Make sure your diabetes, your hypertension is under control. Make sure if you're on HIV treatment that um, your immune system is is is, uh, is 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 okay. That means your CD4 count is normal, uh, because if your CD4 count is too low, you may not even respond to the vaccine. Your body might not respond by producing uh, the fight that the body should produce when you are vaccinated. So make sure that uh, uh, you are relatively well uh, before you are vaccinated. Even people with allergies can be vaccinated they should actually be vaccinated because there is nobody who is immune to COVID-19. But what we encourage is, if you've got serious allergies, get vaccinated in a, in a station that can uh, take care of you if you should react uh, in a bad way, if you should react to the vaccine. So go to a hospital and get vaccinated there rather than being vaccinated at some remote rural clinic where help may be very far away. So essentially, uh, that's uh, uh, everybody above 18 should be vaccinated. Uh, let's talk about adverse events and side effects. What is the difference between adverse events and side effects? And after taking the vaccines, do people witness or experience adverse events or side effects? What are the examples of ad adverse events or side effects that are experienced from uh, these vaccines? 
The term we use is adverse events following immunization. This term is a general term that describes all bad things that happen to you following immunization. Now, these bad things may be due to the vaccine itself. In other words, it might be a side effect of the vaccine, or they may be coincidental. It might be something else uh, that, uh, that happens. So um, uh, that's the difference. So adverse events include true side effects that are caused by the vaccine and other adverse events that have probably nothing to do with uh, the vaccine. An example of an adverse event that has nothing to do with the vaccine is a patient might pitch up with malaria two days after vaccination, in, but you don't know that it's malaria at the beginning. The patient has fever, rigors, a, a headache, and so forth. And you investigate, you test, you find, ah, it's malaria. The malaria is an adverse event following immunization because it has happened immediately after immunization. But it's not a side effect of the immunization itself. It's just coincidental. You treat the malaria and you are done with it. But true side effects of the vaccine can also happen. People can develop rashes. People can develop anaphylaxis, which means uh, your whole body sort of collapses, your blood pressure goes down. If it's a true uh, allergic reaction. Um, those things can happen. They are rare, but they can happen. We heard about clots forming uh, due to some vaccines in the West, AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, and they, they tried to investigate those, uh, whether they were true uh, side effects of the vaccine or they were just coincidental, because that disease happens also in ordinary uh, day life without any vaccination program. So, But I think their final conclusion was this does not seem to be related to the vaccination. Uh, let's continue with our vaccination program. So that is uh, the difference between adverse events following immunization and the true side effects. I understand that when a country receives supplies of vaccines, uh, the first step is to get regulatory approval of the vaccines in the country. Uh, national regulatory officials will closely examine the clinical data and then uh, decide whether or not to approve the vaccines. So from your understanding, did these vaccines been through this approval process before they were rolled out in Zimbabwe? Well, the truth is that uh, we are in an emergency situation and the procedures have not been followed closely. And we can't blame anyone. We can't follow those procedures closely where a medicine takes two to three years to get registered for use in a country. We are in an emergency. So what uh, the regulatory authority is doing at the moment is simply to look at the dossiers provided by the manufacturer uh, and so forth. And the WHO is uh, the one which uh, goes out to look at the actual manufacturing plant to check out the good manufacturing practices and uh, the issue an emergency use authorization. But our own regulatory authority also issues a, an emergency use authorization. And they did that before the WHO did. Uh, that is okay. Why is it okay? Because all vaccines right now, COVID-19 vaccines, are under trial. There is no vaccine that has stood the test of time. Uh, we need a few years to actually say this vaccine is good. It's not causing adverse events. But we can't wait for years while people are dying in their hundreds of thousands. So this is an, a, an emergency situation where we are relying on past experience of vaccines. Uh, and we do believe we have made the correct decision to roll out uh, these vaccines uh, in Zimbabwe, which are actually whole virus, uh, killed virus vaccines, okay, inactivated virus vaccines. Uh, which I think are quite safe, and uh, but we'll see. Time will tell. Uh, you know, you can't be a prophet as far as this is concerned. So I think necessary procedures were followed in this emergency. It's all right as it is. After the vaccines were rolled out, is there a process that is being undertaken to measure the effectiveness and the safety of the vaccines in Zimbabwe? 
the process for monitoring uh, uh, side effects and for monitoring uh, efficacy of the vaccine, which means is the vaccine working, is standard procedure when you introduce a new vaccine. We, we, we would like to hope that the government has put in place the measures to measure efficacy and safety of the vaccine. Uh, and that reports are actually being made to the relevant authority, which is the Medicines Control Authority on side effects, adverse effects, adverse events following immunization. Uh, the only bone of contention we have with the government right now is they have not published any data yet. We have vaccinated over 650,000 people and we still don't have data on adverse events following immunization in Zimbabwe and uh, they have not yet told us anything about the, 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 the efficacy of the vaccine. Uh, so we are waiting um, uh, very anxiously to hear from government about that. Doctor, let me also uh, shift my focus to uh, variants. What do we know about variants? Uh, do these variants differ from the usual viruses that we know? And is it unusual for viruses to change? Uh, do vaccines provide protection against these variants? Viruses are always changing uh, their protein structures. It's a survival uh, tactic. Uh, so they also want to survive. So they change their proteins. Uh, the vaccines that we have, most of them are targeting the spike protein uh, on, the, on the virus, which is that protein which is sticking out, which gives the vaccine the name, uh, the, sorry, the virus, the name Corona virus. So um, they change a few things here and there in order to, 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 to escape destruction. Uh, that will always happen. We, we see that with the HIV. We see that even with uh, bacteria, they undergo mutations when you expose them to suboptimal uh, uh, concentrations of antibiotics and so forth. So it's very usual for viruses to change. Uh, the vaccines that we have work very well. So far, we have no proof that uh, they don't work against certain variants. Uh, but that is ongoing work. Uh, we must continue to be on top of our game. Uh, so they will continue. You know, with the flu virus, the seasonal flu virus, uh, every year we produce a new vaccine for the seasonal flu virus. Why? Because it mutates all the time. And the vaccine you got last year does not necessarily protect you from the flu strain that is circulating this year. That's why you continue. We don't know whether that will be the case with uh, COVID-19, um, but we do hope that the vaccines that uh, have already been produced will continue to protect us uh, against uh, COVID-19 uh, sickness and uh, serious disease. So in short, yes, vaccines protect even against the variants, but we have to wait longer to see whether the vaccines that we have now will continue to protect against all variants that will come in the future. So just another word on the variants. Um, it was on the news today that uh, uh, the world is preferring to stop stigmatizing countries by saying this is the South African variant, this is the Indian variant, this is the British variant. So they have tried to give them simple names like uh, the Alpha variant, the Beta, you know, uh, the Delta variant, and so forth, uh, so that we identify these names, these variants using neutral names rather than stigmatizing a country. Uh, we'll see how well that works. Dr. Mazzolera, with this pandemic, the world is in this situation where uh, new evidence comes in almost every day and we are learning new things. Uh, but at the same time, we have, to, we have to act in real time to protect ourselves. How in this scenario with the new variants, how can people protect themselves and what should our government be doing? Yes, things are always changing. 
uh, with this pandemic. Uh, new countries speaking at, dif at, at, at different times, uh, new variants coming up. Uh, a, a lot of things are changing. New treatment modalities coming up, new vaccines coming up, technology that we have not used before, uh, very unproven technology, but uh, very promising technology all the same. All these are things that our government should be seized with. Um, what should the government do in this situation? It's an evolving uh, pandemic. There is no one who has got all the answers, but there are certain common sense things that we have established now up to now. The first one is we should concentrate on COVID safe uh, procedures. The things that we have mentioned already, you know, uh, social distancing, masking up, uh, hand hygiene, cough etiquette. Uh, you know, isolation of, of those uh, who, who are positive for COVID-19, contact tracing and uh, community surveillance, uh, quarantining people from uh, outside, and so forth. In this instance, I think one important thing that our government should concentrate on, instead of concentrating on lockdowns, mind you, we believe in lockdowns and we believe they help, but they are not the panacea to this problem. Uh, the government should not just be locking down cities uh, and the country willy-nilly. Lockdowns should be informed by science, and lockdowns should be reasonable because we can destroy people's lives and we can destroy the economy by doing unreasonable lockdowns. In this instance, I think um, reducing uh, uh, immigration from hot spots like India at the moment uh, is the most important thing. Uh, we should not have immigrants from India. If somebody really has to come to Zimbabwe from India, they should uh, be quarantined for two weeks uh, at a designated place. This business of saying go and do self-quarantine at home doesn't work because when people get home, their relatives are excited. They all come to see that person to greet them and hug them. You know, they haven't seen each other for years. Uh, so self-quarantine at home doesn't work. We need institutional quarantine when we are faced with such a difficult problem like the Indian uh, outbreak, uh, which is really raging like a bed fire. Uh, most countries have done that. And uh, Zimbabwe, I'm glad Zimbabwe has said uh, we are now uh, quarantining people from India and we're discouraging immigration from India. So these are the extra things that government can do but most importantly, COVID safe procedures within the country uh, and just uh, patrolling our borders and making sure that we don't get illegal immigrants. Uh, let's talk about the storage of vaccines. From what you know, how are the vaccines being stored in our country? If they are transported to raw areas, for example, how are they being stored? And uh, please, may you kindly share with us the importance of a vaccine storage. I understand that they, sh they should be stored under a certain temperature. Uh, what's the temperature range for the storage? The good thing about uh, all the vaccines we are using is the storage temperature required is the same as the storage temperature required for all the other vaccines that we have been using in our expanded program on immunization. So we have the infrastructure and the hardware already uh, to use. We have the static stations, the clinics, and the hospitals where vaccines are stored between 2 degrees Celsius and 8 degrees Celsius. And we have the cooler boxes that they use to go out uh, on outreach missions to vaccinate. These cooler boxes will have ice packs and they will be able to keep the temperature uh, for the vaccine between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius, uh, and that's okay. So, yes, the cold chain is being maintained within the country uh, because the vaccines that we chose uh, are quite friendly to our situation. They don't require any extra uh, infrastructure or hardware. Doctor, does taking the vaccines mean an end to COVID-19 and uh, back to normal life? Yes, once we vaccinate enough people uh, to reach what we call herd immunity, um, we should expect that uh, COVID-19 should cease to be a problem in Zimbabwe. 
uh, herd immunity, we don't know what percentage of people must be vaccinated in order for us to reach herd immunity for COVID-19. But the government is working with a figure of 60% at the moment. We'll see when we get to 60% where that will be the magic figure. The, you know, it varies from virus to virus. Uh, for some viruses, it must be 90% of the population vaccinated and so forth. But uh, let's work with 60% um, and wait and see uh, what happens. Life should return to normal. Life should return to normal. Remember, there are some people within the community who are so far not eligible for vaccination. That is the under-18s. So um, a target of 60% is quite all right for now. Um, with uh, smallpox, I've already mentioned, we got rid of smallpox and life came back to normal. We are nearly getting rid of polio. Measles is under control. As you can see, we're no longer getting the florid cases of measles that we used to get uh, in the 80s. So vaccines do work, and vaccines are the answer to this kind of pandemic, and the vaccines should help us to return to normal uh, with, with, within the shortest possible time. There has been widespread uh, vaccine hesitance uh, in the society lately. From your perspective, what do you think might be the cause of vaccine hesitance uh, by some sections in Zimbabwe? And how can we best improve? Right. The issue of vaccine hesitancy, we just have to be fair and uh, direct about it. The people in Zimbabwe are hesitant to take these vaccines for two reasons. Number one, they don't trust Chinese-made products. Number two, they don't trust the government of Zimbabwe and their politically made decisions. People don't believe that the decision to get Sinopharm, Sinovac vaccines was scientific. They believe it was political, and that's disastrous. People still don't trust. I still talk to a lot of people who tell you that they don't trust uh, the Chinese product, and they don't trust the government. They think the government is doing it probably for personal gain, uh, you know, within the hierarchies of the government. And so that's a tragedy. Government must improve its image so that people can trust its decisions. Uh, that's the major cause of vaccine hesitancy. The second cause is uh, not enough information has been disseminated. People don't know anything about these vaccines. Even health workers, I've, I've tried to, to, to look for information about Sinovac, Sinopharm uh, vaccine, uh, and everything was written in Chinese. So uh, the package insert for the vaccine is in Chinese, and I can't read that. Um, the government should have made effort to give a lot of information to health workers, technical information about the vaccine. Uh, that has not been done. And thirdly, even the health workers themselves, because they don't have information, they are not able to recommend this vaccination program to the ordinary people. And if the health workers are not able to recommend to the ordinary people, uh, then why should the ordinary people take it? They are also suspicious. There are health workers who still have not been vaccinated, and some of them may actually be going around vaccinating people when they themselves are not vaccinated. I'm sure you see how serious that is. There is lack of trust. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mazoya. It has been a pleasure discussing the COVID-19 vaccine. You were listening to The Healthy Talk, a program brought to you by the Community Voices Zimbabwe. I'm Perseverance Javangwe. As Dr. Mazorela said, vaccines are our only chance to curb the COVID-19 pandemic. I therefore urge you to get vaccinated. But let's not forget to mask up, keep physical distance, and always wash our hands with soap. <laughs> <laughs>